Let's answer some more questions about MS from Twitter and YouTube. Leslie Maxwell asks, is there a way to know how long you've had multiple sclerosis based on the size, number, and location of the lesions on MRI? I've been diagnosed with MS for two years, but I think I've had it for 10 years, maybe longer. So this is a good question. There's a lot of evidence that the underlying pathophysiology of MS occurs long before the onset of symptoms in most people. How do we know this? Well, for example, there are some people who have an MRI of the brain for an unrelated reason. Maybe they have a head injury, and we could see lesions that look just like multiple sclerosis, but they don't have any symptoms, so they don't meet the diagnostic criteria for having MS. This is known as RAS, or radiologically isolated syndrome, and some of those people end up having multiple sclerosis, but develop symptoms many years later, even decades later in some cases. Also, sometimes when we have a patient who's diagnosed with MS, they will retrospectively report they had a symptom many years ago. Maybe someone will say, you know, 10 years ago, I had an episode where I had blurry vision and pain in my right eye. I was going to see an optometrist, but it just went away on its own, so I never saw them, for example. Sometimes it can be crystal clear. Sometimes it can be a little bit more speculative, but it's likely someone with a new diagnosis of MS, unless they're young and they have big, fluffy, active lesions on MRI and no old scar tissue it's likely they had the underlying disease for some period of time. Now, to answer the question, unfortunately, it's very difficult to say exactly how long. If a lesion is new and active, there can be a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, and the gadolinium dye can get in, causing it to enhance. But this only occurs for approximately one month with new multiple sclerosis lesions. If lesions are older, they're more likely to be dark on T1 sequences, cause so-called black holes, and there's more likely to be associated with atrophy, or loss of tissue in the area. So if we see an MRI that has a lot of black holes and atrophy, it's likely that MS has been present for a longer period of time, even if there weren't obvious symptoms. But this is all speculative. There's no way I could say that an old lesion is two years old or 10 years old or 20 years old. It's just impossible. Lydia and Anthony ask, can MS cause heart problems? In particular, Anthony says he has a low resting heart rate of 45 to 55, though he's a young athlete. Now, in general, MS itself does not cause heart problems. However, there are rare exceptions to that. For example, some people with spinal cord lesions can have what's known as autonomic dysfunction or changes in the subconscious nervous system, and they could get things like lightheadedness or changes in heart rate, but it's not too common. Also, there are other things with specific multiple sclerosis medications, such as the S1P phosphate receptor modulators, such as Gelenia, Mazent, and Zyposia, and they can cause a temporary reduction in heart rate or even rarely more serious problems like heart block and atrial fibrillation, but generally speaking, MS does not cause heart problems in terms of a young athletic person with a low resting heart rate, that's often normal. Obviously, talk to your own provider. I myself, when I was younger and and fitter, easily had a resting heart rate under 50. Chris asks a bunch of different questions. The first is, could CRISPR be used to treat multiple sclerosis? So the CRISPR-Cas9 system is gene editing technology scientists can use to create a desired sequence of nucleic acids, RNA, or DNA. Previously, only very complicated and limited cell biology techniques allowed for gene editing. Now it's much easier, faster, and cheaper. Now, MS is not a genetic disease per se. There are genes associated with with MS risk, so do I think that CRISPR could be used to edit the genes within a human with MS to somehow alleviate their disease? Probably not, because there's not a single gene to target. However, do I think CRISPR could be used to create biological compounds that would treat MS? Almost certainly yes, and that's probably going on right now. How, when, why, how soon? I don't know the answer. Your guess is as good as mine. He also said, I had wicked mononucleosis at age 14. Is that the culprit, the cause of my MS? Well, there is very strong evidence for an association between Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, the virus that causes mono or glandular fever, and multiple sclerosis. Some studies found that 100% of adults with MS have evidence of antibodies in their blood, suggesting prior exposure to the virus, whether they had symptoms or not. And people who actually have clinical mono, meaning they have symptoms, you know, sleepiness, they have double the risk of MS. And some experts, such as Professor Gavin Giovanoni, has said that EBV could be the cause of MS, I'm not so sure, but I definitely think it's part of the causal pathway. I have a separate video on this topic if you want to take a look. How about lion's mane? Can that be used to treat MS? So lion's mane is a mushroom used as an alternative medicine. There's some basic science evidence that it has some potentially neuroregenerative properties. For instance, it may stimulate brain-derived neurotrophic factors 
factor. But all the research I could find is basic science studies or animal studies. I couldn't find anything in actual humans with MS, so I just don't know. Maybe it could, maybe not. The last question is, can people with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis stabilize or get better? And the answer is absolutely yes. I have a lot of patients with progressive MS who have been very stable for years, although some do get worse, of course, and some have even had significant improvements. Now, to be honest, to have a very dramatic reversal of disability with progressive MS is a small minority, unfortunately. Dr. Murad Orton, a Turkish physician, asks, I have a lot of patients with migraine who have an MRI of the brain, and they have T2 hyperintense lesions, but they don't have any MS symptoms. What do you make of this? Well, a lot of people with migraine will have abnormalities on their brain MRI. Specifically, they'll often have subcortical white matter T2 bright lesions, but they look different from demyelinating lesions. They're often smaller and patchier, and they aren't in typical areas associated with MS, such as in the paraventricular white matter, juxtacortical lesions, corpus callosum, cerebellum, and brainstem. Obviously, it takes a lot of skill and experience to learn the difference between demyelinating lesions in MS and these so-called unidentified bright objects or UBOs, which are generally speaking harmless and require no specific treatment. I suppose if you're not sure, you could always refer the patient to a neurologist. I do these consults all the time. Because of the lesions in the brain, Jeff asks, are people with MS at increased risk of stroke? Do the lesions damage the blood vessels? To my knowledge, the answer is no. There's no specific association between MS and stroke. It turns out the lesions in the brain and MS actually form around the veins, specifically the post-capillary venules. But as far as I know, there's no association between diseases associated with venous problems in the head and MS either. For instance, things like pseudotumor cerebri, normal pressure hydrocephalus, dural venous thrombosis. As far as I know, none of these diseases are associated with MS. Fishnose asks, I have nighttime leg and arm numbness, tingling, and burning, and I had a nerve conduction study, and it was normal. So to start off, a nerve conduction study is actually a test used to diagnose peripheral nervous system disease, such as carpal tunnel syndrome, or a herniated lumbar disc, or cyanide sciatic nerve problems, for example, or diabetic neuropathy, it's expected to be normal in someone with multiple sclerosis. So the symptom you're describing is most likely neuropathic pain, which is common in people with MS, and sometimes it's associated with a relapse, in which case it likely gets better on its own or with steroids. If it's a chronic problem, there are various treatments for this. I do have a separate video on this exact topic if you want to check it out. Some examples, which I'll put up on the screen, are things like the nutritional supplement, alpha-lipoic acid, ALA, 600 milligrams twice daily or acupuncture and there are also various prescription drugs to treat this such as gabapentin and nortriptyline and they can all have their own side effects. I apologize for some of the technicalities here. This is just a note I give to myself if I need some ideas. James Wilson asked, how would a positive JC virus antibody test affect your recommendation for disease modifying therapy? So I'll give my own opinion here. Please talk to your own provider. I want to give a little bit of background. The JC virus is the John Cunningham virus and the virus is everywhere. Approximately half of the adult population has been infected by this virus, but it doesn't matter because your immune system just shuts it down and it doesn't cause any symptoms. However, pe for people who have an immune suppressed state, in rare cases, the virus can become activated and actually infect the brain and cause a horrible disease called PML. This stands for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Very serious disease can be disabling or even fatal. In people with MS who get this infection, the mortality rate is a little bit under 25%. I have never had a single patient with MS in my career get PML. I do have one patient who had AIDS who got PML, who did not have multiple sclerosis. Now, this infection, PML, is most associated with the drug Tysabri. There have been hundreds of people with MS who took Tysabri and got PML. The way that Tysabri works is it blocks the lymphocytes, a subclass of white blood cells, from getting into the central nervous system. And so those cells are not surveilling the brain, and hence there's this risk of infection. Now, in terms of counseling our patients, the main test we do prior to starting Tysabri is this test called the JC virus antibody, which tests whether or not you've been exposed to the virus. And if you're an adult, the risk is roughly 50-50. It turns out if you test negative, the risk is very low, estimated to be less than 1 in 10,000. However, people can change from negative to positive, and so we often test this every six months. And if someone changes to positive, it doesn't mean they have PML, but it means there's an increased risk of getting PML. So 
So me personally, I would try to avoid giving the drug Tysabri to people who have a positive test on the JC virus antibody. Now it turns out there's another test called the JC virus antibody index, which is sort of the equivalent of a titer or level of the antibody. So if someone is less than 0.2, it will be rated as negative. If it's 0.2 to 0.4, it will be rated as intermediate and another test called inhibition will determine the result. And if it's greater than 0.4, it will be read as positive. But it turns out that if you have a low level of the JC virus antibody index, the risk of PML is still fairly low if that titer level or index level is low. However, this index is only accurate in people who have not received prior immunosuppressive drugs. So if you previously received an immunosuppressive drug, this index can be falsely low. So definitely I would avoid giving Tysabri to anyone who has a history of prior immunosuppressants who has JC virus antibody positive, regardless of their index level. Now in very rare cases, I might give Tysabri to someone who is positive if their index is low. For instance, if someone was previously negative and they have an index level of 0.5 and they've done really well on the drug and I counsel them about the risk and they're willing to consider it and there are no other good alternatives, for instance, I might continue the medication. But again, it's the patient's individual decision. So that's sort of the story with Tysabri. Now, unfortunately, even with other disease-modifying therapies, there are very, very rare cases of PML. So, for example, with the drug Ocrevus, I'm aware of one single individual who got PML after taking Ocrevus. Now, there are several people who took Tysabri before and changed to drugs such as Ocrevus or Gelenia and were later diagnosed with PML. And we call this carryover PML because it was mostly caused by the Tysabri, not the second drug. But there's one person who did not previously get Tysabri who only got Ocrevus who developed PML. Now, this is extremely, extremely rare. Uh, there are also rare cases of PML in people who took the drug drug Tecfidera, mostly associated with low levels of lymphocytes, which is why we do blood tests in people taking Tecfidera. There are also, to my knowledge, over 20 people who got PML taking the drug Gelenia. And so these cases are very, very rare, but they do occur. Now, me personally, my opinion is given that the risk is on the order of one out of tens of thousands, I personally would not even check the JC virus antibody prior to starting these other drugs except for Tysabri. I would talk to my patients about the risk of PML. You know, I would say there are other rare infections, such as this specific infection, PML, but I wouldn't necessarily do the test because it wouldn't necessarily change my recommendation, whether it's negative or positive. Certainly, in my opinion, having a positive JC virus antibody test is not a contraindication to receiving drugs such as Ocrevus, Tecfidera, and Gelenia. And the way I would explain this is by saying, look, Let's say you're taking Gelenia and you're afraid of a 1 in 20,000 risk of PML. I'm sorry to break it to you, but the risk of other side effects such as COVID-19, heart block, atrial fibrillation, shingles is much, much greater than the risk of PML. And so a 1 in 20,000 risk is really trivial in comparison to the other risks of the drug, in my opinion. But of course, if a patient wanted the test, if that would influence their decision, I would certainly offer it to them. So I hope you enjoyed the video and let me know if you have any other questions or thoughts in the comments below.